Greetings, gentle viewers. This is... Yes, you have another paper you haven't reviewed you. I fucking know. I am literally standing here in front of the fucking camera. You're embarrassing me in front of the... Underlings! Ooh. Get over there, then. Ah! Greetings, gentle viewers! This is another Patreon request. It's a rock and roll fairy tale with Russian surf music. This is Six String Samurai! You know you can't hurt me until you finish the Patreon review things, right? Six String Samurai was a passion project for both star Jeffrey Falcon and director Lance Mungia. And their names are astounding. They're both 50% amazing and 50% terrible. They probably should just merge their names somehow and both call themselves Lance Falcon. This is an awesome film, but another minor cinematic tragedy is both have done very little since. Star Lance Falcon has done mainly bit parts, and director Lance Falcon has made The Crow, Wicked Prayer, aka The Crow 4, aka The Crow starring Edward Furlong. Do you have any respect for the dead? You're really pissing me off! AKA the film that killed the franchise, and this franchise survived Crow 2, City of Fucking Angels. <laughs> it looks like he just realized he's Edward Furlong and is really disappointed. That's fucking brilliant. Paris? <laughs> the apocalypse is gonna be one hell of a honeymoon. <laughs> but still, they got this, and it is awesome. It's an alternate reality that diverges in the mid-50s. Someone set USA up the bomb and the Soviets nuked the shit out of the place. Leaving Las Vegas the only free city and Elvis as king. Now it's decades later and Elvis has died without an heir, so the rock and roll legends from the cursed earth are heading to Las Vegas to take the throne through the power of rock. And or roll. Didn't I fucking tell you this was awesome? We open up with a short trailer for the new hot Shigorni Weaver movie, Palm Trees in the Mist where she goes to study trees in their natural habitat and mysteriously later has her head split in half. Then, someone's watching Myra Breckenridge and after Judgment Day and the crawl that it brought, we see that Nevada got 80% more wheat after being nuked. Hold on, call back to the left behind review. This is amazing, it looks like Nevada. We've truly been blessed with a miracle. So this kid and his mum are being chased by some caveman. They're culling the wheat from the strong, the wheat from the chaff, if you will. This means killing the mother and trying to do the same to the kid. Now, this might seem extreme, but that kid is really annoying. Next time I suggest that we all just assume that the apocalypto Neanderthals have good reason for killing children, even if they physically can't tell us what they are. <laughs> anyway, Buddy Holly arrives to save the kid in an action scene that's groundbreaking in how it's shot. As in, it's shot in such a way to try and convince you that you're already drunk. Weirdly, after saving the kid, Holly just walks away, leaving him with his mom's corpse. Hmm. Maybe just wanted some sport. Ah! Float away, little butterfly. Just flutter away. Well, of course, maybe he was gonna help, but something changed his mind. Ah! Fine, die then! Ah! That noise is about 70% of the kid's lines. We are so blessed. Okay, kid, we need to endear you to the audience. Give it all you've got. Ah! Perfect. You're still there. Buddy, who speaks mainly in ADR at this point in the film, puts a literal line in the sand and gives the kid a warning. Cross that line, kid. Cut your little teddy bear in half. Kid, hope teddy bear is not a euphemism. Anyway, the kid really cleverly employs some Gordian knot style logic and just removes the line before leaving the bear behind it. The kid looks amazed at the very existence of stuff that's not wheat. Oh hey, the Red Elvises, the world's greatest Russian surf band, are doing an open air concert! <laughs> very good guys, short but pointless. <laughs> I've seen them described as slightly more ska than surf, but that's a bit of a moot point. Surfing is just skating on the ocean. Anyway, some bowlers stroke assassins are on their way to kill Buddy, and that carpet won't threaten anyone ever again. Don't touch my guitar, man. Don't even touch my guitar. Hollow Body Six String, 1957. A good year. The best apocalypse we ever had. The bowlers have been sent by Death. Yes, Death, who slash from Guns N' Roses because Jerry Only would be too obvious. Nice tuxedo. 
nice tuxedo to die in. Ugly bowling shirt to die in. Clearly they want it that way, seeing as they brought morning stars to a katana fight. <laughs> well, that's a gutter ball. Or a strike. Whichever bowling pun works better there. No, no, actually, wait. There's three of them. And three strikes in a row is a turkey. That's a turkey! <laughs> actually, no. That was shit. Should have said that was a split. That's when he split their head from their shoulders. One of their knife pins, because that's dedication to a gimmick, ended up in the fuel line of a local gas station. Because while unbroken glass is a thing of the past, the gas must always run free. This is America after all. Anyway, Charlton Eastwood. Nice car. Thanks. No relation drives in, and the kid steals his car before an errant spark lowers the property value by exactly zero by exploding the fucking place. I guess it's not my day. You're it! Buddy and the kid are being chased with the Slag Brothers from Rocky Races in the slowest chase in post apocalyptic diesel punk history. Seriously, you could walk up to them, scream, WITNESS ME, and then overtake them on foot. And this was sped up! Anyway, the Red Elvises are killed by death for not trying to kill Buddy, thus proving that no matter how much I like them, they're nothing compared to Motorhead. Anyway, back with the chase, it's become a full-on deranged road warrior as the cavemen are catapulting gumballs into Buddy's car. Most things in this film are built from old Americana, mainly from around the 50s, and these cavemen are clearly obsessed with Flintstones fans. Yeah, they started in 1960, but... Overall, that's far from the most anachronistic thing here. You know, this film is so dedicated to realism, they spent almost 30% of the budget on antique gumballs. That's the sort of made-up fact I put into a review, knowing at least one person will end up believing it. Be amazed at my deviousness! So after escaping the caveman, the car breaks down and Buddy decides to walk. Walk for his life! Ah! Ah! Good idea. Fight fire with fire. Mm -hmm. ah! No matter how many people walk on the gumballs, they never fall down because no matter what it sounds like, this is technically not a cartoon. The kid manages to fix the car via the miracle of corpse water from a nearby grave, thereby supercharging the car with the power of ghosts. And hopefully the caveman spirits will be enslaved too, because Buddy's about to kill the shit out of them. Now, look at the lighting changes between shots. It's like they spent all day and the evening filming cool shit and then tried to make it coherent in editing, and kind of failed. Still cool, though. Swell. I see your sarcasm, and I raise you sardonic. Damn it, he didn't bake in the trunk. I could have had veal. The car finally dies. Again, outside the home of the most obvious cannibals since Sonny Bean was found in a cave filled with piles of human flesh and four generations of incest children. All they're doing it is just threatening you up for the slaughter. Ready to eat you alive. You just get popper every time we see you. <laughs> the dad appears to be the unholy union of Stanley Tweedle from Lex and evil Dick Sargent. And oh, fuck. Look at the decor. I think they nuked St. Clara's house. <laughs> Don't you think this is a nice family, kid? Buddy decides that this is the perfect place to leave the kid. I think he's hypnotized by the mother's vibrant hair. Anyway, within literally minutes of him leaving... He looks nice and marinated, dear! Where have you, Falux? Luckily, the kid is saved with the timely intervention of the astronauts that live under the windmills. Windmill people! I hate those guys! Astronauts made of water coolers and bandages. It's like John Waters made Apollo 11. Since Lance Falcon has made nothing worth talking about since then, it's like he blew his creative load in this film. It's like a bank scene, a toilet wall, in a desert. <laughs> In a space suit. No one can hear you scream. Also, no one can tell if you were the same actress as the bowlers. Holy shit, they found a perpetual motion machine and just walked past it! Oh no, it's just wind. False alarm. <coughs> now, armed with a bike, we get the Godfrey Reggio shot. Ooh, ah, wow, glorious, magnificent. out there who's guitar.
guitar big shall litter my path to Vegas. Death has taken time off to kill every rock and roller who wants to become king, and I have a couple of questions. One, does this mean that no one can die outside the USA? And two, if he becomes king, what the fuck happens then? Will controlling the fine balance between life and death and ferrying the soul to their eternal rest become a hobby? Or does he plan on just taking the title and letting his homophobic Morlock from Indiana do the actual presidenting? Oh, wait, sorry, I have no idea how that turned into a thing about Donald Trump and it's too late to cut it out now. So yeah, they got a bike. It doesn't last. <laughs> the aftermath is terrible, the kid is jamming his knee. <laughs> But he finally makes a kid stop crying with a cross between a Big Daddy reference ah! <laughs> and an acrobatic show reel. <laughs> and good old fashioned borderline child abuse. Let's hope that he crosses the border. Ah, shit, death is killing El Mariachi. He won't be able to make Desperado. Truly, this is the darkest timeline. Now, death is always on foot, but Buddy sometimes is a vehicle, and death is gaining. Is that symbolic or just slasher movie rules? Anyway, Buddy's arrived in a small town called Fallout. They're really into bottle caps. <laughs> oh, fuck, the apocalypse was not kind to Yardley Smith. Arrival! Merman from He-Man? They couldn't afford Ram Man, Beast Man, or even Man Man? This town is shit. And that fits, because it's meant to be the Munchkin Village. You see, this film is a rough retelling of The Wizard of Oz. I didn't mention it before now, because they only just worked it out. Follow the yellow brick road, homie. It takes longer for taller people to experience outside stimuli, because the signals of that stimuli need to go longer to get into their brains. That means the shorter you are, the further your perception is in the future compared to those of an average height or taller. And that guy's so short, it's the mid-90s! That joke doesn't actually make any sense, but in my defense, in context, neither does his outfit. Anyway, Buddy ditches the kid. Again. I'm not blaming him, but it never goes well for anyone involved. Take me to the land of Being a class act, the Red Elvis is from beyond the grave! Decided to serenade the small boy to try and make him feel better. It didn't work. It also makes a scene where a cheerleader made from 60% dust tries to seduce Buddy with chewing gum a bit weird. My name is Elvis. Oh hey, short people are immune to death. I gotta try this out. This is test 1.1. Holy fuck, it worked! Woo! Science! Well, that brings the kids' total lines to four. Ah! Wah! <laughs> and achoo! While Buddy's attempting to have what passes for sex in this town, the kid battles his way through the set, hiding the dry ice to enter the bar. And it looks like he's at a fashion show. The kid is modeling an astounding number. It's an exclusive piece from Armane called De Chabe, made from real lamb's wool and human skin. <laughs> you must have heard the legends about the kid. How do you like it? Do you know who I am? Nope. Ah, <laughs> oh, shit, the young John Cusack clone doesn't look too impressed with Buddy. Hey, Four Eyes! Hey, they say you can kill over 200 men and, and play a mean six string at the same time. Hey, what's my line? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that really true? Cusack really hates Buddy for some reason. Hey, what's the matter? You scared? You don't want to be like me, kid. Go home. Start a family. Get a picket fence. And star in being John Malkovich. <laughs> So, while that was going on inside, Death's minions looked down, spotted the little person, and strung him up. Semi-naked dwarf hanging him. Sure there's a fetish for that. Now, I know how to defeat the four I fought. First, we kill him. Second, he's dead. His heart is his weakness. The boy. No! You stab him! In his heart! Water. 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 Ah!
Hey, if it's Lost Vegas, then how come they know where it is? Or is it just lost something? Because I'm pretty sure everywhere else has lost just as much, if not more. How much further? If they keep walking, they're just gonna find the second half of the Perils of Gwendolyn. Oh, hey, John Cusack's found them again! Hey! Four eyes! I don't have a family! I don't even have fever pitch! They gave that to Jimmy fucking Fallon! No! Well, that was anticlimactic. Yeah. I gotta get a new gig. But that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to become king. Pay attention to the plot, buddy. I'd be glad it wasn't Joan who's like your father. You're shitting your own fingers for a month. A 56 Chevy Bel Air can kick a 40 Sam Buick Roadmaster's ass any day. At least in a first quarter mile, that is. I preferred you when you said, Meow! Bye. Kid, can't you have sex with another tortured musical ninja? He's clearly not into it. Into it or not, it's soon the morning, and they're on the tit dunes of Arrakis, and the beating sun is too much, and death is upon them. Who are you? Death. Cool. Oh, I'm sorry, how rude of me. I said COOL! Deaf or not, she really needs some better minions, and I wanted to teach mine how not to swallow their own hands. Oh hey, wind farms, we've gone in a circle. <laughs> Try to break your neck. There's a good kid. <laughs> Yes, movie! I too remember Pulp Fiction! Yeah, it's an actual piece of 50 surf rock, but it was so connected with Pulp Fiction that I'm pretty sure it's only here in case we forgot this was made in the 90s. <coughs> oh shit, a graboid! Oh well, he's dead, now let's all remember the kids solemnly and be glad that we'll never have to hear him say Mah! again. No? Let's all have a moment's silence. The oh, fuck! The kid gets kidnapped by a land octopus at the asylum lost while they were filming nearby. Luckily, Buddy can track it by its dragon sword howls. Well, it's either that or the wind farm turns wind energy into pure, unadulterated dragon sword. Anyway, Buddy gets away from death and finds his way into the octopus's base after the kid. Death decides Buddy's too much work and heads off to find some easier guitarists. Let's hit it. This whole thing really shows Death's lack of confidence in his guitar skills. I mean, he's Death. Even if he loses a guitar battle for the throne, he could force the winner to die of vaccinations or gummy bears or something. Look, he's Death. Why does he need to hunt people down and murder them one at a time? That's like Zeus only be able to hit you with lightning if he introduces himself first. And away in the pit, we really see the most pure form of design aesthetic to be as cheap and to make as little sense as possible. Another one fucking arena. Look at these guys, for instance. They look like plague doctors crossed with the contents of a dominatrix's rubbish. So, what is this place? Some quasi-hell thing? Welcome to hell, boy! Okay, not a quasi-hell thing, then. You could just say they're trying to scare him, and yeah, they are, but this asshole was killed earlier on by death and still has the arrow jammed in him. So yeah, hell. That's presided over by the great and powerful Spazmaster. Bow down before the great and powerful windmill god. What, you expecting someone bigger? If I were you, I'd run! If you were me, you'd be good looking. Anyway, Buddy saves the kid through the eternal power of killing shit and clicking his fingers. And Joshua the Anarchist goes hungry. I'm still hungry. Well, I'll be. Looks like I'm gonna make my gig in Vegas after all. 
Oh, they found a real perpetual motion machine. This could change everything. You could save the world, rebuild the country, and... Oh, fuck. Some kids just want to see the world burn. With all the 1950s Americana, I cannot wait for someone to attack Buddy with a malt shake grenade. It won't be the Russians, though. They haven't even had any bullets in decades. No one goes to Las Vegas without papers. I'm not even sure why they're there. I mean, Nevada is meant to be the last free state of the USA, unless they just meant Vegas' city was free. But if that's the case, why weren't there any Russians earlier on? I do not like rock and roll music. It is too loud. I like folk music. Soft, nice music. Ah. As it is, it looks like the Soviet general went to Apocalypse Now on us. I'm not complaining though, the resulting action scene is fucking awesome. <laughs> How is it they have no bullets but have mortars? Or is that just Buddy Super Saiyan powers of rock? <laughs> hey, since all the good martial artists in this are musicians in our world, does that mean that this guy is the guy? Oh no, he's too shit. I tell you, the Russians aren't men like you or me. They don't bleed when sliced with a katana or turn into a fine red mist when hit with artillery. They just stop. Like clockwork men with their communist cogs broken inside their dead souls. Excuse me, could I just distract you for a brief second? Huh? <laughs> little orphan Annie can Skywalker. Hello, my name is Brad Majors, and I'm looking for my fiance, Janet Weiss. Kid? You know, everything else is falling apart, but those yellow lines are fucking amazing. The kid drags Buddy, inch by agonizing inch, to the Emerald City, where, if the wizard is beneficent, they'll be able to find out which of them is Dorothy. Only one man can kill this many Russians. Andre Chikatello. They quickly work out that it'd be silly as he lives nowhere near Nevada. Assume it's Buddy's work and follow. Congratulations, kid. We made it. Vegas! Huh. Lost Vegas is Tomorrowland. I can't tell if that makes a film make less or more sense. <laughs> you have an appointment with Dad. But I ain't been in a plane in years! So it's time for Buddy's last fight as he faces off against death in a guitar duel for the boy's soul. Because that's... A. Important to Buddy for some reason. I only take what's valuable to you. You can't have him! And B. Hey, death, isn't a guitar battle with him what you wanted to avoid? Hence all the killing. Fuck it, Amplus electric guitars at 30 paces! You know that statistically, at least one of them should have hit him by accident by now. No, you don't, Megatron! Out of the way, Hot Rod! Anyway, yeah, the kid's running in to try and save his idol from his arch nemesis, and it goes about as well as most things the kid's done all film. Still, at least he now is his own live-action Sonic the Hedgehog cosplayer. Buddy keeps fighting, but doesn't even think to use his newfound speed advantage, so the battle doesn't go well. Now, bend before the ways of heavy metal! The weight of heavy metal? The pun's so bad, you almost wiped out the awesomeness of heavy metal! Yeah, I know he didn't actually say that, but he should have! It's quite appropriate that death is metal, because, apart from, you know, death metal, Buddy's about to be killed by death! Oh shit, I made that joke earlier. Oh well, fuck it, it's Motorhead. You're lucky I don't make it 12 times a minute! <laughs> Admit it. My Schwartz is superior to yours! 
And my buddy's defeated because exhaustion, dehydration, multiple blunt force traumas, stabbing, slicing, and arrows tend to throw you off your sword fighting game. Leave him alone! So it's up to the kid to win, via the miracle of another Oz reference. Because this is the Wizard of Oz, but only when it's convenient. What? A little bit like Emerald City. This is a satisfying ending! So if death's killed by water, how can people drown? And more importantly, with death... dead, why can Buddy die? But does he even die? Because this is set in 1997, when Buddy Holly should be in his 60s. So has the radiation given him Wolverine healing? Maybe, he did survive a fuckload, but at the same time, this happens. Arise, Buddy Holly us prime. <sighs> Yeah, the kid turns into Buddy, so either he's not the real Buddy Holly, but some kind of samurai guitar mantle passed down to the worthy and the transformation is symbolic, or this is a really fucked up version of the Santa Claus, where Buddy's consciousness and identity is contained in his clothes, and he takes over the kid's body, turning it into his own. Though, as a matter of kid-hating principle, I've gotta go with the Santa Claus idea. So that's that, Buddy Holly as Prime uses the power of rock to probably become king, and I'm just guessing here, but unlock the power of the Matrix to kill Stalin who, naturally, is planet-sized. This is a classic of 90s indie films, offbeat, probably single-handedly inspired Fallout, and much better than the subsequent careers of the director and the star would suggest. Ironically, the only person to go from this into big things is composer Brian Tyler, and his work here is overshadowed by the Red Elvises. If you want a genuinely original take on a few familiar things, you know, post-apocalyptic films, classic rock, and martial arts, then check this out. You probably won't regret it. I'm the Amanda Hagen, and I have to live with that every day. Means we're all fucked. Colonel, kill motherfuckers.